can they? And, and if they can, how can they affect a human being? So they, they absolutely can affect a human being. And there are several ayat of the Qur'an which tell us about them affecting people and how that might happen. People can be divided into two types. There are some who are just fraudsters, who are just, you know, like it's all just trickery and sleight of hand. And, you know, they, they find out about their audience beforehand and they ask deliberate question to someone in seat number 25 who is prepped to answer. What happened was that Suleiman, uh, he passed away. And remember, he had many of the jinn that mm. worked for him. Allah, one of the things that he gave to Sulaiman, that, that Allah gave to Sulaiman, that was unique to him, is that he what he had a control over mm. the shayateen and the jinn, those who worked for him. And when he died, he he died, and he was simply leaning on his stick until something like a termite or an an, an insect from the earth had been chewing at the stick, and he fell down. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said that this is, Allah told us that, that, that if it were the case that the jinn knew mm. the unseen, they wouldn't have remained in humiliating, mm. uh, in this uh, humiliating torment that they did because they, mm. they didn't even know that he had passed away. Yeah, definitely. And you can see, to be honest, if you look at the people who are famous for this in the world today, like famous magicians, famous uh, fortune mm. tellers and so on, so. you can see from them Mm. How they interact with the jinn is very mm. clear. In fact, you don't. There's no. It doesn't need to be any conspiracy or any sort of like, you know, hidden information. You can actually just clearly mm. see it as clear as as day. Mm. You can see the way that they're interacting with the jinn. Mm. Young kids. We had a case of some young kids over in Dubai, and those young kids went to a haunted house, mm. you know, and they really came out really unwell. You know, they came out with so, mental health issues. Um, they came out uh, with real, like really troubled, you know, like mm. severely sick and unwell. Um, and they just went because a bunch of young kids who just seen so many stories on YouTube and all yeah. oh, we should go and, you know, they snuck in and they... You shouldn't go searching for... You know, don't, don't go yeah. searching for the jinn and the shaitan. Mm. How many people have had cases, multiple cases in front of me? Etc. What message would you... I think I would start with something really simple. If you remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is khaliqu kulli shay, He created everything. And Allah created therefore the jinn. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what everything that they do. And Allah is ala kulli shay'in qadir, able to do all things. Yeah. That on its own gives you so That's much common. confidence. Yeah. That okay, how is it ever possible mm. that the jinn and the shayateen could overcome mm. the command of Allah? It could never happen, right? Yeah. There are some simple steps that people need to take. Just Start from the beginning. Don't say, mm. I've been there, I've read Quran, I've been to the Sheikh, I did, I did. Because everybody says that. Mm. Start from zero mm. and start with just attaching the heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> it's John Fontaine. Just before we begin the podcast, please make sure you click subscribe and also set your notifications. And make sure you check out the earlier podcasts. We're up to around 40 podcasts so far. There's lots of podcasts there for you to benefit from. Make sure you check that out. Also, if you can go to the John Fontaine YouTube channel as well, click subscribe, set your notifications, and also enjoy the other videos. There's a Thick of Love series, a series on Christianity, and other videos uh, regarding Dawah. Also, if you'd like to support the podcast by supporting us financially uh, with the equipment and the travel costs and the running costs, not just of the podcast, but also the other Dawah activities I'm involved in, please support on the Patreon account. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Welcome to the Young Smokes podcast. Today I'm joined with Sheikh Tim Humble. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm very well, thank you. Good to see you again. It's fantastic to see you. Alhamdulillah. In a different setting from last time. I know, Alhamdulillah. We're outside. Outside. And, uh, alhamdulillah, getting some fresh air. It's absolutely fantastic. How's the lockdown been? Uh, it's not been too bad, Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Uh, I think whenever you find a, a, a door is closed to you through some mm. means, another one opens up by the yeah. grace of Allah, Al-Fatah. So, yeah. Alhamdulillah, we found a lot of opportunities to change things, do things a bit differently. But I'm, I'm very, very happy now the masjid is open. At least we can go to the masjid. Alhamdulillah. That was alhamdulillah. a big thing. Yeah, subhanAllah. It's not easy, subhanAllah. No. I remember the first time I went to the masjid after lockdown. It just felt amazing, subhanAllah. It felt like Ramadan. You know? I know, it completely. Like... Yeah, it, it was, that yeah. was the biggest thing that I missed. Yeah. The rest of it, I could manage, you know, being at home. Yeah. Generally, I'm, I'm at home anyway, so mm. it wasn't too difficult. But the, not being able to go to the masjid, that was 
that was a little tough. Yeah. Sheikh, I wanted to, I know you've got a lot of content online, uh, you know, written content, also videos about Rukia. Um, yeah, but true. this is uh, something I particularly wanted to ask you personally okay. and kind of, you know, the last podcast, we kind of touched upon it, but I want to go into a bit of detail, okay, um, no problem, sure. not just from a kind of protection Islamic perspective, um, but I actually think it is actually also a possible uh, way of dawah personally, um, because the, um, you know, like non-Muslims generally, a lot of them do actually believe in the unseen world That's and, true. and it's just kind of giving them an Islamic perspective of that unseen world. So first of all, maybe we can just speak about the Islamic perspective of um, like the world of the unseen, the jinn, uh, mm. magic, sihr and things like this. So I think it's really important to note that in Islam, one of the most fundamental things that, that makes us who we are is our belief in the ghaib. So right at the very beginning of the Qur'an, Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah Azza wa Jalla said, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ When he's describing the successful people and describing the Muslims in the very first few verses after Surah Al-Fatiha. So he describes one of the, the main features of, of those successful people is that they believe in the unseen. And the word ghayb is used for everything which is unseen to us. We, we can't see it. Mm. We can't test for it. Um, you know, we can't use any sort of uh, equipment to perceive it or to view it is something that's hidden from us and so in all honesty a lot of things come under that I mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes under generally the topic of the ghayb because mm. believing in Allah is believing in the unseen likewise paradise and hellfire uh, the grave and the punishment of the grave uh, and the world of the angels and the world also of the jinn so it's really really important for us that we believe in mm. things which are unseen and that, that is something which, I mean, even if you look at atheism, right? When people talk yeah. about atheism, what's the major thing that comes up all the time? This thing about, you know, the fact that you guys believe in things that are not seen, mm. that are not, you know, within the realm of the world of science, for example. And one of the things that, broad, in, broadly speaking, fits into the unseen is the world of the, the jinn. And the jinn are a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They share some traits with us and they differ with us in some things mm. so they share the trait that they are uh, they have uh, al-aql they have intellect and they have free will and choice mm. to do good or to do bad but they differ with us in the sense that that we can't see them they inhabit a world that that is unseen to us and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about them nahu yaraakum huwa wa qabiluhu min haythu la tarawnahum that he and his tribe see you from where you don't see them. Mm. So they have similarities with us in the sense they have free will. They have a choice to uh, be from the people of paradise, the people of hellfire. And at the same time, uh, they also differ from us in the sense that they inhabit an unseen world. Mm. It's really important when we talk about them though, that we ground, because it's from the ghaib, mm. that we base our discussion about them around the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Yeah. Because when you go off that topic, obviously people, I mean, how many people make videos, right? Yeah. Paranormal videos, yeah. ghost videos and haunted houses and all that type of stuff. It's really, really important that we yeah. ground ourselves on yeah. the Quran and the Sunnah yeah. and what the early generations agreed upon. Yeah. And there's no harm in experience, mentioning experience. Yeah. But I think whenever I mention something from experience, I always try and flag it and say to you, yeah. this is my experience. But... Yeah there might not be an evidence for that yeah. one way or the other. Yeah. So so this, this this kind of spiritual world of jinn, like obviously we have this physical human world which we're aware of. So you, the jinn are around us, right? So there's like jinn, yeah, like absolutely. here now. You Because we don't perceive them and we don't see them, it's difficult for us to really be able to say any, with any great conviction about, you know, sort of um, certain things about where they are. and so, Because of course we don't see them, but... One of the things that we know is that, for example, all of us have with us a Qareen. Uh, and the Qareen is from the jinn. And it's, uh, you know, it, it is from among the shayateen, from among the, the, shayta mm. the shaitan, that tells you to do uh, wrong and encourages you to do wrong. And that's mentioned in various places uh, in the Qur'an, in Surah Qaf, for example. قَالَ قَرِينُهُ رَبَّنَا مَا أَطْغَيْتُهُ uh, the Dakarin will say, "My Lord, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, cause him to go 
into to this transgression. But he was in a very he was far astray. So uh, this is something which is mentioned also. So in that sense, yeah, you know, this whole world we have, you know, the world of the angels we talk about, we don't perceive it at the end of the day. But every one of us has an angel on the right, an angel on the left. Every one of us have angels that prevent certain things from happening mm. to us. Uh, so ultimately, this is something we don't see. It's from the world mm. that it's from the world that we don't see. So of course, this is one of the the pillars of Iman to believe in in the unseen world, specifically the angels, which obviously you can put the no jinn with that as well. Yeah. You know, so as a Muslim, we we have to believe in 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 these creatures, these these creations, yeah. right? Absolutely. And the fact that they are mentioned in the Quran in quite a lot of detail. Mm means it's not something which is found in a rare book. It's not something where you have to, mm. you know, delve into a rare book of hadith somewhere to find. You can find information about them. For example, there's an entire mm. surah of the Quran, Surah Al-Jinn, mm. which tells us about them um, and tells us about what they do, uh, a little bit about uh, some of the history behind them uh, and so on. And likewise, the end of Surah Al-Ahqaf as well tells mm. us about a group of the jinn that listen to the Quran from mm. the Prophet So these are this is, these are things that you can find just by looking at the mm. Quran. It's not something where you have to sort of go very far away or a kind of specialist knowledge that only a few people know about. Mm. It's something that's actually very clear there for us in the Quran to, yeah. to pay attention to. So, I mean, you know, we, we have... Uh, we, as I mentioned this to you last time. Of course, we have... Uh, we're living in a time where mental health uh, is an issue and, and also we're getting a lot of issues with people who may or may not be affected with, with jinn. So how can these, these jinn, can they? And, and if they can, how can they affect a human being? So they, they absolutely can affect a human being. And there are several ayat of the Qur'an which tell us about them affecting people and how that might happen. Um, for example, if we categorize the, the way that they affect people into different categories, there is one which is just simple possession. And this is mentioned, for example, in, in Surah Al-Baqarah. Those who devour riba will stand on the day of judgment like the one who is possessed by the shaitan, driving him into insanity. Mm -hmm. So this concept of mess, of being touched by the shaitan, is something that is... It was known to the mm. Arabs prior to the coming of Islam mm. and it was affirmed and confirmed by the Qur'an and within the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam as well. Then you have also the issue of magic, sihr, And this is something in which the jinn can have an involvement but it, it also is something a little more complex than that because here you have someone who is, if you like, manipulating them or using them uh, as part of this sihr, this magic thing, mm. in order to cause harm to someone. This is also mentioned to us in Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, Allah is which I mentioned in ayah number 102, which is a long passage of the mm. Quran, nearly half a page regarding Suleiman and what Suleiman was accused of, because of course Suleiman was accused السلام, of performing magic, and that wasn't actually true. He, he was, of course, a, as a prophet, he would not have been anywhere near yeah. anything like that. But they accused him of it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, وَمَا كَفَرَ سُلَيْمَانُ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا It wasn't Suleiman who disbelieved, but it was the shayateen who disbelieved. يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسِ السِّحْرُ They teach the people magic. And one of the things we can take from this ayah, this first part, is that sihr is something which is learned, something mm. which is taught. Mm. Because he said, sihr. They taught the people. So it's not like, you know, people read sort of, you know, the, the, the Harry Potter kind of, you know, yeah. um, the way it's presented, that someone just wakes up one day mm. and they just realize that, yeah, you know, this is some, I have these different supernatural gifts and powers. But it's not actually the case. It's actually something yeah. that people learn and it's something that people... Uh, cause a lot of harm to other people with and uh, that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he described it as kufr as disbelief mm. and that's why he said the, the shayateen the devils they disbelieved mm. and likewise uh, he told us about it uh, they learn from them what causes a husband or wife to break apart so it's something which has very real effects and that mm. also tells us that there is no such thing as white magic or good magic or, you know, um, like they talk about uh, traditional magic, things like mm. that, where people talk about, oh, we're just using it for, we're using this, these effects mm. for good or something like that. That doesn't exist. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, That the one who purchases this is not going to have any share in the hereafter. So from all of these things, we learned that it's something which is learnt that it's something which has very real effects upon people. 
that is something that involves the jinn and the shayateen. Uh, that it is something that doesn't have a positive side or a good side. It mm. can never be used for good. And it's something which constitutes disbelief in Islam. Mm. So that's that aspect. The third aspect that we often look at is the issue of al-ayn, of, mm. of the evil eye. This is also mentioned in the Quran. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about the disbelievers who would always make you uh, They would almost make you fall over or slip through their eyes. Mm. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned uh, regarding in, in Surah Al-Falaq مِنْ شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حَسَدٍ From the evil of the jealous person when they, show, when they have jealousy. So these are all things which are mentioned to us in the Quran and the Sunnah expands mm. upon that, gives much more information mm. about them. Uh, and each one of them could have an, a relation to the jinn in one way or another. Mm. But the evil eye perhaps we could make it more of a separate category because it mm. doesn't have to necessarily involve the jinn. No. What, that's what it appears to me, that it doesn't yeah. necessarily have to involve them. Um, mm. As for uh, jinn possession and magic, mm. those two require or are more likely to involve mm. the, the jinn of the shayateen. SubhanAllah. So this kind of, you know, you get people who are dealing with, with the, this unseen world, people who are dealing with the jinn. Not only people, you know, you get people who even may claim to be Muslim. You know, they look like Muslims, they have the, the robes and the hat and everything. Uh, I've, I've witnessed this, this in Africa, but you also have like non-Muslims, so uh, what's common these days, and it's more common than we think, subhanAllah, you know, you have uh, in the newspapers, you have like horoscopes, yeah. you have mediums, healers, yeah, healers, not only that, even like, um, and I'm not just talking about like these kind of um, people from abroad, right, you have like mediums, like what are filling like stadiums, you know, in Manchester we have the MEN arena, Big stadium holds around uh, maybe fifty thousand people, and they'll have like a medium come, you know, and they're claiming to actually contact, you know, dead people, maybe your uncle or your cat or your dog, or yeah. you know, that. And but in fact, do you think these people actually also uh, yeah. deal with the jinn? Or? I think these type of people can be divided into two types. Mm. There are some who are just fraudsters, who mm. are just you know, like it's all just trickery and sleight mm. of hand, and you know, they they find out about their audience beforehand and they d ask deliberate question mm. to someone in seat number 25 who is prepped to answer, yeah. that, that does happen. And we've seen some really funny stories of, of mm. that, to be honest. Um, it's obviously not something which is ever could ever be justified in Islam or allowed mm. in Islam. But there are some stories which are, when you hear about how, what the extent, the extent to which they mm. will go to actually, uh, you know, sort of present these falsehoods to people, mm. it's amazing. Yeah. You know, people with uh, briefcases with false bottoms in them and then they're telling people that the jinn took their money and in reality yeah. it's just, you yeah. know, yeah. and yeah. just people doing all sorts of tricks. Someone who's levitating but he's just got a, a little a sort of a, a stick underneath him that winds him up and winds him down. <laughs> all of these things are, yeah. they really do yeah, exist. Yeah. And yeah. likewise, you can go to certain fortune tellers who just will look at you and say, you know, uh, or I think you know you're you're troubled, and then they're just mm. very very good at getting you to talk. Yeah, you know, and you're like, yeah. yeah, actually, I do feel troubled. Mm. And they're like, mm, you know, I mm. and they just sort of look look at the you know the tea leaves or mm. the, all of this this category of people are are literally copying the people who really do this, but they're just basically faking it. Yeah, and the the next category are those who do it for real, and that's what, that's something which is which is really really concerning, because the Prophet ﷺ he spoke about this and he told us. Uh, that whoever goes to a kahin or a arraf, someone who tells you where your lost things are, or goes to a fortune teller or a sorcerer, this person has disbelieved in what was revealed to Muhammad. Mm. So in Islam, we're absolutely prohibited from anything like that, whether it's from the point of view of trickery or mm. the point of view of uh, real uh, sort of seeking help from the jinn and so on. Mm. Some of them, the arraf, for example, they specialize in telling you where your lost things are. You can go and say, I lost my keys or... I lost my, uh, you know, my car or something like that, and they actually seek the help of the jinn, and mm. they, uh, you know, they perform acts of worship to other than Allah, and they worship the jinn. They call upon them, they seek their help, mm. and then they, from that, they gain information. Mm. Not that the jinn have that information themselves, because, for example, when yeah. Suleiman died, Suleiman had died, yeah. and all, all of them. Yeah. <laughs> And لو كانوا يعلمون الغيب أنا بيثو في العذاب. Tell us what happened with uh, this 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 instance because people might mm. not be familiar. With so it. what happened was that Suleiman, uh, عليه السلام, he passed away, 
And remember, he had many of the jinn that mm. worked for him. Allah, one of the things that he gave to Sulaiman that, that Allah gave to Sulaiman that was unique to him is that he what he had a control over mm. the shayateen and the jinn, those who worked for him. And when he died, he he died, and he was simply leaning on a stick until something like a termite or an, an an insect from the earth had been chewing at the stick, and he fell down. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said that this is Allah told us that, that that if it were the case that the jinn knew mm. the unseen, they wouldn't have remained in humiliating mm. uh, in this uh, humiliating torment that they did because they mm. they didn't even know that he had passed away. Mm. You know, so we we should avoid this idea of thinking that they know the unseen yeah. and they know everything. But of course, you know, they pass information quickly between each other, and we we have a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ tells us about how they climb on top of each other to reach mm. up to the heavens, and then mm. you know one of them on top of the other, and they try to just steal a word, just mm. a little piece of information. Mm. Mm. Then uh, the flaming uh, fireball it, it strikes at them, and perhaps it will hit them before they pass the information mm. on, and perhaps it will hit them after they pass the information mm. on. Finally, they take it down to the sorcerer or the fortune teller who mixes with it a hundred lies. Mm. So you see, the fortune teller is believed because of one single yeah. truth that is heard from, mm. that was heard from the angels. Mm. So it's something that it's, mm. uh, we, have to, we have to be against it. You know? Even like, like you say, these, these um, kind of mediums or fortune tellers, sometimes the jinn can like move something in the physical world. And it gives, obviously for us, it's, it's, it's like uh, amazing because we can't see it, right? It's, we can't see how that is doing it. But in reality, it's a trick because it's a part of the unseen. It's yeah. nothing that special. It's not like this fortune teller has like powers or anything. Yeah, definitely. And you can see, to be honest, if you look at the people who are famous for this in the world today, like famous magicians, famous uh, fortune tellers and so on, so. you can see from them Mm. How they interact with the jinn It's very mm. clear In fact you don't, there's no, It doesn't need to be any Conspiracy Or any sort of like You know Hidden information You can actually just Clearly mm. see it As clear as, as day mm. You can see the, the way that they're Interacting with the jinn yeah. The way that they describe Their general life mm. The sort of uh, Signs Signs of worship They have mm. To the, like devil worship And stuff that they put Upon themselves mm. And things like that And the way they describe Their Their method of learning And so on mm. It's very very clear That and, and, and a lot of people might think that a lot of these stage performers are just fraudsters and yeah. tricksters and so on, but it's not the case. A lot of them mm. are seeking help from the gym. It's, it's a very, very troubling situation, especially when we've got young guys and mm. young brothers and sisters who are actually watching them mm. and following them online, Spong. watching their videos. And, you know, at the end of the day, there is a hadith which indicates that the person who, who watches them for entertainment, his salah will not be accepted for 40 days. Spong. And whoever believes in them, then that person has disbelieved in what was revealed to Muhammad So it's, it's very, it's very, 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 very serious. serious yeah. SubhanAllah. You know, of course, it, within our deen, our religion of Islam, uh, Allah has told us ways of protecting ourselves. But what I'm finding is this, uh, this past few weeks, SubhanAllah, this is why I wanted to do a, 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 you know, specifically speak about this topic, is people are, have come to me saying they've had this issue, that issue, and they've been to a so-called Raqi or a, sh or a Sheikh and they've said and the Sheikh has asked them for their name their mother's name and this kind of alarm bell started ringing because obviously I, I was familiar with your work uh, on uh, you know on this and, and again I've heard you say before that this is kind of you know a sign that they're not doing the right yeah. thing and and I asked I asked the person I said was this person contacting the jinn and he said yes so I wanted to kind of run this yeah. by, is this permissible for someone to contact the jinn? No, and, and we know that Allah Azawajal spoke about it very severely, in, for example, in Surah Al-An'am. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala He spoke about on the day when Allah will gather all of the mm. people together. Ya ma'ashar al-jinn qad istakthartum min al-ins Or group of jinn, you have really uh, you have really abused your, you know, mankind, you have really, you know, you've frequently been interacting with each other and their awliya from among the men they will say Rabbana stemta ba ba. Oh our Lord we benefited some of us from each other and we had a relationship where we were benefiting from them and they were benefiting from us and we have reached our time that you've appointed for us mm. he said the fire will be your abode 
and you'll be in it forever. That is a very severe, severe warning against any kind of interaction with the jinn. Mm. And that's why we're not per permitted to interact with them at all. And a lot of people, you see, you have different people. You have, in terms of the people who pretend to be, for example, a raqi or a yeah. healer in this from among the Muslims. You have different, different sort of people. Among them, you have those who really have been confused mm. and they really believe that their interaction with the Muslim jinn is something mm. permissible. And perhaps even they think they're talking to angels. Mm. I've seen people who will say, this, yes. you know, oh, this wow. is an... I have an angel mm. who comes to me and gives me these things. Yet the Prophet ﷺ said, mm. he said, uh, mm. By the one my hand is, by the one whose hand my soul is in. If you remained in the state you are with me and in the state of remembrance that you have with me, the angels would shake your hands. He said that they would shake your hands on your beds and in your roads. This indicates that that doesn't happen. I mean, he's saying that, did any of you see the angels shake your hand? Did any of you see the angels come and see? The angels don't do that. And so these people have been tricked and fooled into actually dealing with the jinn and the shayateen and thinking that those jinn and shayateen are angels. And even if you ask them, okay, yeah. what do you do to bring this angel? They say, I sacrifice an animal and I spill the blood or I uh, make sajda to a, to a stone or to a rock. Mm. Which angel comes to you when you make oh, sajda to a stone? Which oh. angel comes to you when you sacrifice animal mm. to other than Allah? It's not an angel, it's, mm. it's a jinn. And of course, angels, they, they can't disobey Allah, right? They, they don't, don't disobey they, Allah. Only the humans like, and the jinn have this. Yeah. They don't disobey Allah what he commanded them and they do what they've been commanded. Mm. So it's something which is, some people are fooled like that. Others know what they're doing, but they have taken it as a means to earn money um, uh, a means to, to become sort of to gain some degree of power over people, influence over people, mm. to you know, sort of uh, to, be, to, to gain some sort of reputation in mm. society. So, there's different reasons why people do it, but ultimately, we first of all, the, the biggest solution to this is for people to learn how to treat themselves, first of all. But even that, when you go to someone, you go to someone that you are absolutely certain of their belief and the way that they treat people. Mm. And you avoid any kind of, anyone giving out ta'weed, mm. uh, amulets, anyone who is saying un, you know, ineligible, mm. sort of unintelligible words, like strange, strange mm. words, words that you don't understand. Anyone who asks you to do weird things, mm. uh, haram things, mm. anyone who asks you to bring an animal to sacrifice, or anyone asks you to bring item of clothing, or anyone who asks for your mother's name, or asks for you know personal information or a photo of you mm. or of your children, anything mm. in that regard, all of that is just mm. another example of magic. Whether the person really knows what they're doing or whether the person thinks they're communicating with the angels, it doesn't matter mm. to me. Ultimately, what they're doing is they're worshiping the jinn, they're, mm. they're performing magic. So well, you made that point in the beginning, the, the importance of coming back to the Quran and the Sunnah. You know, you said, yes, we do have like uh, experiences, you know, which may, you know, you have to take it with a certain pinch of salt. Absolutely. Really. But when we come back to the Quran and the Sunnah, you can't go wrong. You know, Absolutely. you may, you may have your trusted sheikh at the mosque or whoever, but the, bo the, the bottom line is that where's the evidence for what you're doing? You know, it, you have to go back to the trusted sources, right? Absolutely. Because ultimately this is from the, as we said in the beginning, it's mm. from the ghaib, right? It's from yeah. the unseen. And nobody knows the reality of that unseen except Allah. So ultimately, we can't, we don't have a way to even mm. manage it. Like, how do I even, where do I even start from? And really, there's only two sources of information about this kind of thing. There's either an authentic source, which is the Quran and the Sunnah, what the scholars of Islam have agreed upon. And there are sources which are basically from the, the jinn and the shayateen and just, you know, people who've, learned from them so you have to ask mm. yourself on which side do you, do you fall and where, mm. where where are you going to learn from at the end of the day mm. and so if a person wants to protect themselves ultimately any kind of seeking help from the jinn it doesn't actually protect the person at all mm. and that's why you see these people get amulets they go and get an amulet for a couple of weeks they feel better then they go even worse than they did before mm. because Allah told us the shaitan will never keep his promise mm. I promised you and I broke my promise mm. so you have to understand that Allah's promise is true mm. and that Allah Azawajal will always guide you to what is best for you and will give you the treatments best for you mm. and that includes treatment to cure you from the problems you are going through, the issues of the jinn, magic mm. and so on but 
going to the jinn and the shaitan to try and make some kind of agreement or pact, ultimately that's only going to bring sadness upon a person and it's only going to cause them to get even more sick and even worse in the situation. Even if they feel like they got better for a short time, in, in the long run, and especially when you think about after they die, the situation is, is not going yeah. to be like that. You know, an, an interesting thing which I, I took from yourself was that although Allah gives us like ways to uh, protect ourselves and cure ourselves, etc., um, one thing you mentioned as well was the importance of having the correct belief in the first place. Because although, yes, we're Muslim, if you have like kind of the wrong belief, this is kind of leaving you open to you know, these type of things, right? Definitely. And, and just one ayah, which just, for me, just explains this beautifully, is the ayah in Surah Al-An'am, when Allah said, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِمَانَهُمْ بِظُلْمُ أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمُ الْأَمْنُ وَهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ Those people who believe and haven't mixed up their belief with polytheism, it is they who will be safe, and it is they who will be guided. So Allah promised safety, and He didn't mm. specify the kind of safety. Are we talk about safety in the hereafter, are we talk about safety mm. in the safety from what kind of because it's general, it's for everything. Mm. If you want to be safe and you want to be protected, the very first thing you have to start with is the is the right belief. Mm. And that's why when you see somebody who doesn't have that, whether they're from the Muslims who've got mistakes in their belief or whether they're from people coming from outside, you see that the jinn and the shayateen have so much control over them. Mm. So much control. And that's mentioned many times in the Quran. Uh, the the statement of Iblis which Allah Azza told us about in the Quran when Iblis said, mm. alikum min sultan. I didn't have any authority over you. Mm. And when Allah Azza said about him, Inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan. My servants, don't ha- you don't have any authority over them. Mm. In other parts of the Quran, Allah mentioned, Illa man min al-ghawin. Except the sinners and the disobedient ones who followed you. So it's clear that the right, the person with the right belief, the right, uh, the right mindset, that person from the beginning has mm. a degree of protection. F- add to that further, that if they were to follow the sunnah of the Prophet and be strict upon it, mm. that's a further protection. Yeah. Um, because you know, I mean, it's not always, but a, a lot of the time you find not all the time, but a lot of the time you find that most of the people are have are not actually praying their salah on time or even exactly. praying at all. And these are the people that are more likely. Definitely, yeah. Because if if you look at uh, on the topic, for example, just on the topic of following the sunnah. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said That let them take a warning Those people who go against his command Lest they be tried by a, a trial Or a painful punishment mm. So what protects you from being put to trial And being suffering trials and tribulations mm. in your life Is following the, the, the commands of mm. the Prophet On top of that In terms of the prayer We know that the prayer is a major means of protection Whoever prays Fajr in the Jama'ah is in the dhimma of Allah, in the, in the ga- that Allah has guaranteed their protection until the evening comes. Just for praying Fajr in the Jama'ah. But how many people we see, not only they're going to maybe dubious people, taking all kinds of dubious things, all ta'weed and, and strange amulets and things written for them, and on top of that, they're not praying Fajr in the, in the Jama'ah. They're not uh, doing the adhkar in the morning and the evening and after every prayer and before they go to sleep. They're not uh, following the Sunnah of the Prophet Their belief has issues within it And you know if you look at all that When you put all that together mm. It just shows that the person is doing everything, Almost everything wrong You know it's the yeah. wrong way of approaching it Turn it around and start by correcting the belief Following the Sunnah Praying the prayer mm. on time A taqwa Because ultimately even the word taqwa is a shield and a barrier mm. from, So protection through taqwa Through obey, obeying Allah as much as they can Avoiding disobedience as much as they can and then on top of that, a person then follows the means to gain a cure mm. through ruqya, recitation of the Qur'an, through you know, the various different things they can mm. do. Allah, this person, inshallah, mm. will, will be far, far stronger mm. than the one who is going here and there to, to different people and so, using all kinds of forbidden kinds of cures. Mm. So what are some of the, 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 the well-known ways of protect, protection uh, from, from the Qur'an and the Sunnah? Mm. So we spoke about protection on a general level, yeah. right? We, t- we spoke about protection in terms of your belief, your following mm. of the sunnah, your taqwa. So now let's talk about something specific. So in terms of protection, a lot of people go wrong when they think about ruqya because ruqya really is a cure rather than a protection. Mm. Really. Right. N- in most cases, mm. there isn't a lot of examples of using ruqya as a pre- preventative measure. Right. More, the more of the examples are actually using it as a cure when a person has become sick 
In terms of preventative measures, what you generally have is you have the adhkar, the dhikr, mm. which, uh, for example, uh, the dhikr of the morning and the evening, adhkar mm. sabah wal masa. This could be the, uh, you read it after fajr and after asr prayer. Um, and if you have, for example, I would recommend everyone watching, if you ha- can get a copy of Fortress of the Muslim, yeah. Hisn al-Muslim, very small book, beautiful book. Check this book, uh, it's a means for me finding Islam. It's such an amazing um, book. SubhanAllah, it was, some, a brother gave me this book and SubhanAllah, I was just reading it. And it's just a book of adhkar, yeah. right? Supplications, yeah. different. Yeah. So in there you'll find a chapter called Remembrances for Morning and Evening. Yeah. So after Fajr, after Asr. Yeah. Before you go to sleep, uh, after the five daily prayers, when you do your Astaghfirullah, 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 you do SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, and so on. Yeah. Uh, Allahu Akbar and so on. You read Ayat al-Kursi after your yeah. prayers. Before you go to sleep, there's another section in Hisn al-Muslim, what to mm. read before you go to sleep. Um, Any time when you're in a situation where you might be vulnerable to the jinn of the shayateen. Mm. Like for example, going into the bathroom. So what do we say when we go into the bathroom? Allahumma mm. inni a'udhu bika min al-khubthi wal khaba'ith. This al-khubthi wal khaba'ith, many of the scholars said this means the male and female jinn. So you're mm. asking Allah's protection from mm. the male and female jinn because this is a place where there is a, a concern or a, yeah. a, a danger. Um, likewise, uh, that a person before they engage in marital intimacy, for example, mm. they say, Allahumma jannab ala shaitan wa jannab ala shaitan, ma razaqtana, or Allah keep uh, the shaitan away from mm. us and keep the shaitan away from what you provide for us. And that just shows you that that is another situation where a person mm. might be vulnerable to the influence of the shaitan. Mm. So the Islam has all these different means of protection, mm. along with the general means of protection, mm. your belief, your following the sunnah, your taqwa, your prayers. Mm. Those are, are fantastic. Then there are even more specific things, like for example, eating seven ajwa mm. dates from Aliyah to Medina. Now, these dates, there's different narrations and wordings. Mm. So there's narration of the word ajwa, and some of the scholars said ajwa are the type that we have today, you know, the, the little ajwa dates. Back, yeah. And some of them said, no, the word ajwa just means a really good quality of, of date. Mm. And some of the narrations mention in Aliyah to Medina from the, a place in Medina mm. called Al Aliyah. And some of them just mention dates of Medina. Mm. And uh, some of them mention dates, mm. but you eat seven of them. Mm. So what we would say is if you can get Ajwa dates from Medina, Alhamdulillah, that's amazing. Mm. From Al-Aliya, that's amazing. If you can't just get any Medina dates, if you can't get any dates, inshallah, mm. take seven in the morning before you eat anything else. Mm. That whoever uh, starts the morning with seven mm. Tamarat Ajwa, seven Ajwa dates will not be harmed by poison or magic on that day. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah, Allah, means of protection. Allah, you know, means of protection. Um, SubhanAllah. So many different things. Mm. Then you go into the next stage, which is the issue of the cure itself. Like if mm. somebody does feel that they're affected. Mm. Because even though I said Rukia is mostly it's a cure, but it could also be used as a diagnostic tool as well. Like for someone who doesn't know mm. whether they've got something mm. wrong with them. Like, you know, you see now when someone feels like they've got something wrong, so many but panic and people say, what should I do when I went to this? And I've seen most cases a lot of the time, the person might not have actually had anything wrong with them at the beginning, mm. but because they went, after they thought they had something wrong with them, they went to the Sheikh person. so-and-so and Sheikh so-and-so, they actually mm. ended up getting the problem from the Sheikh that they went to, not from the actual, actually not from the, the the original thing that they mm. had, might not have actually been something genuinely wrong with them. So then they got sick afterwards. But they got sick afterwards. Or what was wrong with them was very small. Like it was a small amount of ayn or a small uh, amount of mess that could have been removed by the permission of Allah very easily, even just at home yeah. with them by their own recitation. Yeah. But instead, when they went to that sheikh, the sheikh mm. basically, it's like a, you know, it's like a dodgy mechanic, you know, like yeah. if there's nothing wrong with your car, they'll break something and make something wrong with your car. Yeah. So that's how it is. These people, you go to them and say, sheikh, you know, I think I've got an affliction. It's OK, well, if you don't have mm. one, I'll make sure you have one by the time you leave and then I'll sell you the cure, you know. Yeah. So that's how these people work. SubhanAllah, it's very sad. Yeah. So a, a lot of the time it is, as you said, for financial benefit of the dunya. But again, sometimes it's just literally to misguide people, draw them into shirk. And yeah, it's true. You can't guarantee that. The, you can't say to somebody that it's just the financial aspect. Mm. Because there might be genuine people who do take yeah. some kind of financial payment. I mean, mm. I'm not a great fan of it. But mm. at the end of the day, I don't believe it to be outright haram. So yeah. That's one aspect. And th- on the other side, there are even some people who are doing magic and so on and seeking help from the jinn who yeah. actually are not taking money from people. Yeah. It's quite rare, but you do see them. They'll, they'll just come and say, you know, no, I'm just, I'm just mm. healing people. But their goal is just to take people away from the path of Allah. And it's really mm-hmm. interesting because what you mentioned about that is because one of the really interesting things we can learn is that 
for a magician to continue to, mm. to, to be able to use the jinn, mm. they have to be able to provide something more than just their own misguidance. Mm. So in the beginning, you know, people say we sold his soul to the devil, right? And that's true. Mm. But actually, once you've sold your soul, what happens? You don't have another one to sell, right? Mm. So you've already gone. So the shaitan said, what shall I do? There's no point. I, mm. There's nothing you can do for me. You have to bring me somebody else and somebody mm. else and somebody else. And the only way they can continue to perform mm. that magic is by bringing mm. more and more and more people. And human shaitan are like this as well, aren't they? Like they they're not are content yeah. with just doing the crime themselves. They want their friends and they want to that's drag it. more people in. And, and that's why Allah said, Shayateen al insi wal jinn yuhi ba'dhuhum ila ba'dhin zuhruf al qawli ghurura. Shaitan from the jinn and the men. Mm. Each of them inspire each other mm. with false speech in terms of adornment. They adorn their speech in falsehood. SubhanAllah, you think about the shayateen from the, the, the human beings. That's why the, the magician is considered to be that example of the shaitan yeah. from the human yeah. beings because they're cooperating yeah. with the shaitan of the jinn. So I guess, um, you know, all these type of things like ghosts, spirits, what, what non-Muslims might refer to as ghosts and spirits, they're not like the souls of dead people. No. They are actually a separate creation. Yeah, like a separate creation. But that doesn't mean that they, do, they, they don't uh, impersonate them, you know. Like, yeah. Because at the end of the day, if it, if it takes people away mm. from the path of life, it misguides people. So that's what they do. So they can get this information from... Other yeah. jinns, all this well, person. Even, even sometimes, not even information. It's just, yeah. uh, it's just, just you know, the person is willing to be mm. fooled, right? Yeah. The person is sitting there, and they're willing to be, they're willing to be tricked and willing to mm. be fooled. And then, you know, for example, to give it a, an example of that from the hadith, the time of the dajjal, when there is a, a person will come to the dajjal, and the dajjal will say, "If I was to raise your parents alive, would you believe mm. in me?" And he'll say yes, and so the true shayateen will appear in the form of his parents. Because his heart is what mm. he wants to believe mm -hmm. it, his mind wants to believe it, and he's not grounded in the Quran and mm. the Sunnah and not protecting himself. Then I say, I'm going to believe because the, these two parents come and say, My son, he's, he's your Rabb, he's your Lord. Yes, so, this is something which is, mm. we have evidence from, from the hadith. It's not just something mm. that we're talking about from experience. We have clear evidence that this is what they do. Mm. They, are, they impersonate mm. other people in order to make you, uh, mm. particularly people who are vulnerable or susceptible to believing mm. in that. Whereas if you keep, you know, if you sort of have a, a well, if you're sort of well grounded mm. and you don't allow yourself to be carried away by stories and things mm. like that. Like me personally, for all that I talk about this issue and uh, try to study it and try to teach it to people, you don't find many, like I don't really do like gin stories and, mm. you know, stuff like that. It's not something that I, because I just feel like that's sensationalizing the issue even more and it's yeah. leading people to this mm. issue of following them because of yeah. people dramatizing it. Mm. And maybe even young kids, we had a case of some young kids over in Dubai and those young kids went to a haunted house, mm. you know, and they really came out really unwell, you know, they came out with Spine. mental health issues, mm. they came out uh, with real, like really troubled, you know, like mm. severely sick and unwell. Spine. And they just went because a bunch of young kids who just seen so many stories on YouTube and all mm. oh, we should go and, you know, they snuck in and they... You shouldn't go searching for... You know, don't go, don't go yeah. searching for the jinn and the shaitan. Mm. How many people, I've had cases, multiple cases in front of me from the Ouija board, people being mm. silly and playing Ouija boards and, you know, mm. calling upon the jinn <clears throat> and thinking it's just a bit of fun among their friends. And then the next time one of them ends up go, becoming insane or ends up uh, becoming possessed and they start having all mm. kinds of problems in their family and their health and all that kind of stuff. And it's not a, it's a horrible thing to see, you know, when you see someone mm. affected like that, well, it's like you see people like completely broken, like health wise. Oh. They have huge health issues that mm. the doctors can't find the answer to. Yeah. They, psychologically, they're scarred. They're mm. very like struggling to even, you know, just even function. Mm. Um, often, you know, severe with swas in their religion. Mm. They're going in and out of the religion, saying they don't believe anymore, mm. things like that. And mm. all of this because somebody just wanted a bit of entertainment with their yeah, friends yeah. or a bit of silliness yeah. with their friends. Yeah. So we try I to say so. Like every, you know, you, you find it's very common, Spanla. You know, if you want to get a million uh, views on Facebook to go and speak about gin stories but how many people actually come and learn how to actually practically protect themselves and uh, perform rookie or things yeah. like this on themselves and their family See, so are, important there so. are good people alhamdulillah yeah. like doing da'wah who are explaining these things nicely and mm. and sometimes they might have stories to tell but yeah. I think the problem I, you worry about is that other people who speak about it without yeah. knowledge and then they sensationalize it and yeah. they make people interested to the point mm. where someone you know, people mm. will even say, I went and bought books on Sihr. Mm. 
you know, books on magic and, and started reading them. And one, one person recently got in touch with me about this. They got interested in it, mm. they started buying books on it, then they started reading it. Then when they read it, they became affected, they became yeah. confused and they yeah, started yeah. to say, like, I've started seeing, I, I started these symbols and signs mm. and all that type of stuff. You know, I've I seen a, a Dawah book recently. It had been written with the intention of Dawah. Well, there was a lot of research on magic and this, and I was really, I didn't have a good feeling about this book, personally. I mean, the intention was to kind of show all these different types of misguidances and then present Islam. Uh, I, I just, personally, I just felt, you know, you don't really want mm -hmm. to give... A person has to be careful, you know, very careful. Uh, and I think whenever I've, even some people said to me, like, when you've explained it mm -hmm. before, do you feel like there's a danger in that? And I've always said, like, we've always mm -hmm. tried when we explain it to... Uh, limit it to what yeah. is needed for yeah. people to yeah. realize how wrong it is. Yeah. So people said, like for example, when you explained how the people write ta'weef, mm. is that not encouraging people to write it? We yeah. say, well, we don't. First of all, we don't explain the so, whole uh, picture, so, yeah. and second of all, it's only enough for a person to realize that it's mm. wrong. Mm. And once they can see, like how they write the mother's name and how they mm. write your name and how they yeah. calculate it, and then how they. Uh, determine whether you're a person of fire or earth or air or mm. water then they bury the ta'weeh or they hang it in the, mm. on, on the wing of a bird or on a tree yeah. or they put it in a well or yeah. uh, in other places and they do all of that is done through a calculation and when yeah. you show that to people many people take it off and leave it yeah. so that's the purpose behind yeah. it but never ever to give people yeah. enough knowledge to actually yeah, yeah, yeah. write one themselves yeah. or make and one and the themselves. everyday person doesn't need to know all the finer details of these things it's uh, just enough to keep we, away from exactly. it yeah. <laughs> It's, uh, it's not. It's not a joke. I mean, I know you've had many experiences. I've had many experiences with this, and it's not something. It's not fun, you know. It's not desirable. It's not entertaining, you know. It's it's a serious. You know, thing. It's really horrible yeah. to see because yeah. at the end of the day, if it were just in a movie or a story, you know, that would be something different. But it's yeah. someone's real life, right? Yeah. Like it's somebody who really yeah. goes home every night and can't mm. sleep at night and has. You know, all these pains and problems and health Problem. issues and their family are crying over them. Mm. It's a real person's life, mm. you know, like, and that's why it's not, it's not funny, mm. it's not entertainment. What message would you have for, some, have for someone who's, you know, they've been affected by these things, you know, they're feeling depressed, they, they, you know how it is, they, they, they feel like there's no way out, maybe even losing a bit of hope uh, in, in, in Allah, etc. What message would you... I think I would start with something really simple. If you remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is... Khaliqu kulli shay. He created everything. Mm. And Allah created therefore the jinn. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what everything that they do. And Allah is ala kulli shay in qadir, able to do all things. Yeah. That on its own gives you so That's much funny. confidence yeah. that okay, how is it ever possible mm. that the jinn and the shayateen could overcome mm. the command of Allah? It could never happen, right? Yeah. And then on top of that, if you think about the Qur'an, mm. what did Allah say about the Qur'an? لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَىٰ جَبَلٍ لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَاشِعًا مُتَصَدِّعًا مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ mm. If we sent this Qur'an upon a mountain, you would see Allah the mountain Allah. collapse into dust out of the fear of Allah. Yeah. If this is the effect of the Qur'an yeah. upon a mountain, then how about the effect upon yeah. a jinn and shaytan? Add to that, Allah said, إِنَّ كَيْدَ الشَّيْطَانِ كَانَ ضَعِفًا The plot of the shaytan is always weak and he mm. used kana and kana is an arabic word which indicates cons constantly mm. consistently kana always weak. the Allah magician Allah. the magician is a person right <laughs> right and the yeah. person is wa khuliqa al insanu yeah. mankind mm. was created weak mm. a weak person seeking help from a weak shaitan mm. with a weak plan <laughs> and you turn mm. to allah al qawiyul mm. matin mm. al qawiyul aziz the one who has everything in the, in the heavens and the earth is in his hands. The one who, if he wants to command mm. something, mm. be and it is. All you need to do is just attach your heart. Mm. Like that. Mm. But then you have to realize that Allah has put causes and means for things to happen. Mm. So the sunnah of Allah is generally speaking, that Allah gives you some steps that you have to take to achieve things in your life. Mm. Even though he can give it to you instantly. Kun fayakun, you're cured. And I know some people like that. So mm -hmm. raise their hands, Ya Allah, cure me. Da, cured. Like that. Allah. Instantly. Allah. Well, we had cases like that, and our shuyukh told us of cases like that. Where the person said, I just I, I spent Allah my night. I was just in my I, I was just in my, I, I just spent my night just asking Allah for Allah give Allah us tawbah. Well, that's it. Done. I, I got cured. But generally speaking, 
usually the sunnah mm. of Allah with us in this life mm. is that you've got some steps to take yeah. for anything you want. You want to mm. have children, you've got some steps to take. Mm. You want to, you know, be mm. wealthy, you've got some steps to take, right? Mm. You, you want uh, to achieve something in your, in your job or whatever, you've got some steps to take. That's how the mm. dunya is. Mm. So the same thing here. There are some simple steps that people need to take. Just start from the beginning. Don't say, mm. I've been there, I've read Quran, I've been to the Sheikh, I did, I did. Because everybody says that. Mm. Start from zero. Mm. And start with just attaching the heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. If you attach the heart to Allah, mm. that's enough. Mm. From there, tawbah, turning mm. back to Allah, correcting yourself, and lots of dua and dhikr and so on, mm. and then take it step by step. Mm. There'll be days where you don't have, you know, you don't feel like you did as well as you should have. There'll be days where you did very well. Because, like Allah said, mm. tilka al no nas. These days we give mm. different people success on different days. Like you have some days where it's good, some days where it's yeah. not so good. That's normal. And ultimately, there's a great benefit in having patience and turning back, do a lot of tawbah, a lot of istighfar, a lot of dua, a lot of dhikr, and then following a proper ruqya plan. Mm. You know, following ruqya mm. as it should be done, as the Prophet did it, as the mm. Sahaba did it. And inshallah, a person will not mm. find anything from that except good. Mm. I think, I think you know, because it's a part of the unseen, people tend to give it this more kind of importance where it's just like any other test. You know, we're tested Definitely. every single day. You know, we're driving, we're at work, Definitely. we're family, Definitely. We're, you know, whatever it may be. Definitely. And, you know, every every moment of the day, humans are being tested by Allah. For sure. And when abulu kum shari wal khayri yeah, fitna, we test you we with pass. bad, we test you with good. Sometimes we don't, sometimes we pass, sometimes. if we don't pass, we try better the next time. That's it. But it, it shouldn't really be seen as anything more than that. It's a test. And like you said, people kind of sensationalizing it, making it more than it is. You know, we have the ability to get rid of these things and protect ourselves. By the and we should of be content and confident in, in, in the Quran mm -hmm. and the Sunnah. Yeah. We, should have, yeah. we should have complete confidence and trust in Allah subhanahu yeah. wa ta'ala. And then we should go and do the steps. Yeah. And that's what tawakkul really is, right? Mm -hmm. When people talk about tawakkul, what's yeah. tawakkul? Tawakkul is mm -hmm. two things. It's mm -hmm. putting complete reliance mm -hmm. in Allah mm -hmm. and doing the steps that are required so, to achieve your goal. Mm -hmm. If you miss either of those two things, your tawakkul is deficient, right? Mm. So on one side, if your tawakkul is uh, that you are claiming to have that reliance, mm. but you're not doing anything, mm. you're not taking any steps yourself, then that's not tawakkul mm. at, at all. On the other side, some people are running around doing all the steps possible, mm. but they never remember that those steps mm. are not going to, they're not going to achieve something, mm. illa bi idhnillah, except by the permission of Allah. Azawajal. So when you join those two things together and you bring them both, so you're doing the steps that you need mm. and at the same time you're putting your complete trust in Allah and you realize those steps will not be effective mm. without the help of Allah. Mm. On top of that, you're doing what you have to do mm. and you're putting your reliance and trust there. Mm. That's what when a person really achieved tawakkul. Yeah. And ultimately, nobody knows what's written for them tomorrow. Mm. You know, it's not for us to sit here and promise shifa to someone in one mm. hour. Like that's when yeah. you usually get, usually tend to get, uh, you know, magicians and people like that's what they mm. do, right? They'll say to people that, you know, Come to me and I'll cue you in ten minutes, minutes yeah, yeah, five minutes, yeah, and that's not true. Yeah. Um, and, and we should never get into that habit. But yeah. we we can promise a person that if they follow the Quran and the Sunnah, they will only get good, Mashallah. either in this dunya Mashallah. or in the akhirah or in both. But they'll mm. nothing nothing yeah. comes from following the Quran and the Sunnah yeah. except good. You know, a lot of times they people Shaitan is whispering, oh, you know, mental health, uh, you know, a rukia, uh, uh, possession, things like this. You said something very profound. I've told so many people since uh, okay. in the last podcast. You said, I said, Sheikh, how do you know between mental health and, and, and possession? And you said, um, it doesn't matter. You know, the cure is the same. And for me, that was like, that was like a light bulb moment. Yeah, you know, the, <laughs> don't let shaitan kind of worry you whether it is or not. Just, just yeah. the one. And at the yeah. end of the day, there's been many cases where I have presumed that the mm. case was a mental health case. Mm. And then when we've delved into it further with mm. Rukia, we found out it wasn't. And many cases where we've presumed it was a mm. jinn shaitan related issue. Mm. And when we've investigated it, it mm. wasn't. So ultimately, mm. a person, the cure is the, the mm. cure is the same and the method of treatment mm. is the same. So a person shouldn't overly worry about that, but they should let it come with time. Let, let, it, mm. let it come over time. The knowledge yeah. of what's going on, that mm. will come to them over time mm. by the permission of Allah. Like over maybe treatment, few weeks, a few months, until things mm. start to make sense, what's going mm. on exactly. And a person, you know, subhanAllah, there's cases where we've gone for a long time and then mm. changed 
completely yeah. changed my mind about what's actually going on. Yeah. That's that's something which it shows how complex these things can be yeah. because at the end of the day, these uh, mental health conditions uh, and uh, sort of psychological psychiatric conditions really exist. Mm. They're not. They're yeah. not. Yeah. It's, they're not just you know something that the psychiatric world mm. put there to. They they, they yeah. really exist. But the question is for us: Is there something deeper behind mm. that? Like yeah. okay, somebody has let's say bipolar. Yeah. Um, that's a genuine condition mm. which has uh, certain uh, criteria for a mm. person to be diagnosed with and certain treatments and mm. things like that that can be taken. But ultimately, we want to ask ourselves, what's the cause of that? What was mm. the underlying cause? Mm. Because if it is something completely natural, then that has a particular way of dealing with it. And yeah. if it is something from the unseen, mm. there might be other additional treatments mm. that could mm. be used. But ultimately, mm. Rokia should be a part of both of those. Yeah. And anyone who feels like anything from depression mm. down to any kind of uh, sort of uh, psychiatric illnesses, mm. everyone should be using Rukia Shara'iya as mm. part of their toolkit. Yeah. We're not going to say you shouldn't be going to the doctor. Yeah. We're not going to be say you shouldn't be taking medicine, of course. At the end of the day, mm. those things are also causes and means to achieve your goal. Yeah. But we say that Rukia should be a part of that because if you're not doing Rukia, you're not really doing yourself justice yeah. because... You haven't taken the full range of options that mm. are available to you to handle that particular mm. issue. Yeah. Sheikh, all these things we've been speaking about uh, in this episode, you know, they're not just for Muslims. You know, even people who are Christian, uh, atheist, it affects everyone, right? So this is a, a principle the scholars mention, uh, it, and sometimes they describe it and they say, al kufru millatun wahida, disbelief is one religion. Mm. And what they mean by that is that the effects of the shayateen and so mm. on and the way that the shaitan influences people. That is common all over the world, in every mm. place. And that's why you see magic existing in all of these different cultures. And you see mm. even belief in the jinn is, exists in most of the yeah. different cultures around the world, mm. in some form or another. Mm. Uh, you know, in, in various different religions, almost all of the religions have some sort of reference to this, in, mm. again, in some way or another. Yeah. Uh, so I think that this is something which is, it affects everybody. And we, we've seen cases, it's, it's actually really amazing when you go, one of the things I did uh, quite some time back, a few years back, is I went to a museum that deals specifically in the UK, that deals specifically with magic. And when I went to that museum, I actually saw magical artifacts from different religions and from different places in the world. Mm. Uh, some of them were from Africa, some were from Asia, some were from Europe, some were from the UK. Mm. And talking about like little mm. villages in, in, in the sort of, you know, home counties mm. type place, these little villages mm. and things like that that had a tradition of magic. And they these really, are like historical artifacts, Yeah, right? these are all artifacts, like documents, uh, all, mm. all laid out in this museum. Mm. And one of the things that shocked me is how, how common the traits were between mm. the different things, even though some of them were from completely different places, so, um, different times, some of them, you know, mm. three, four hundred years, some of them just 20 years ago, some of them mm. uh, from the UK, some of them were from, mm. you know, the far reaches of Africa and Asia and different places. And honestly, when you looked at it, you actually just saw that there were clearly identifiable oh, common yeah. traits between all of them. Mm. Similar sort of pictures, similar sort of words, similar mm. sort of prayers, um, sacrifices and things like mm. that that were all being done in a, in a very very similar way um, so that's something which is and and yeah. there are people obviously there are you know very famous people who've delved into magic who were mm. nothing nothing to do with islam mm. and even among muslims it's not the case that it just affects practicing muslims mm. or this is what pra how practicing muslims explain mental health issues that's mm. not the case in fact i think if you find practicing muslims who know about this issue mm. they're more likely to be balanced and and more uh, sort of fair on the issue and not be sort of the people who everything that goes wrong with them they blame yeah. on this yeah. um, but they they yeah. kind of see it, it, it as a yeah. balance and they look yeah. that yeah it does exist and it does yeah. affect people yeah. but at the same time there are other things that affect yeah. people as well yeah. so they t so I, I think it's something that affects yeah. everybody yeah. and it definitely has a strong presence in Christianity yeah. in yeah. Judaism in Hinduism yeah. in Buddhism all of them have strong recognition yeah. of these of, mm. of the existence of this thing. And if you like, even, we're not going to say within Islam, but even amongst Muslims, you know, because this is how shaitan kind of takes people away from the religion. You have yeah. people who are, 
you know, they identify as Muslims that have also, you know, got involved in these things. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you only have to look at books published on that topic to mm. see people who were, you know, quote unquote Muslims yeah. who, were, who yeah. had got themselves involved in, yeah. in these kind of things. And uh, again, I've met m several people who've been like mm. that, spoken to them, you know, sort of talked to them about why they went into mm. that and how they got into that and what, you know, sort of advising the, the people to come out of it mm. and so on. You see people at different levels. You see some people who just dabbled in it for a joke, some people mm. who didn't take it seriously, some people who maybe even went in through the point of view of ibadah, mm. worshipping Allah. Like they, they, in fact, like for example, there are some of the deviated groups and sects who will say to people that, you know, you need to say subhanallah, for example, um, 20,000 times tonight. And when the person can't do it, they say, look, I'll teach you a way whereby you can say, you can say it 20,000 times. Mm. All you need to do is just... And then they teach them oh, some way of like seeking yeah. help from the jinn and so on. This is another thing. This, so um, this, you know, when you, you find numbers attached to certain uh, ibadah, you know, it, it, like certain uh, points of worship. Of course, some of them are in the sunnah, you know, which are mentioned yep. in, in the Quran and the Hadith, etc. You know, and and they validated. But what what about when somebody says something like, oh, you know, say this uh, so many hundred times, but yeah. it's not. Like legislate. It's really important because the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Man amila amala laysa alayhi amruna fahuarad. Whoever does an action that's not in accordance with what we've brought, it will be rejected. Mm -hmm. So the very first thing a person needs to understand is when they do something with a number that isn't doesn't have an evidence for it within mm -hmm. the Sunnah, the the very first thing they have to suffer is their action not being accepted. Mm -hmm. So you know someone says sat here and read Surah Yasin like 57 times mm. for to have done such a big effort but then not to have it accepted because it wasn't the right number yeah. that's not the right thing to do yeah. so um, in terms of Rukia itself there is a there is a proof for, for reading an ayah once or three times or seven times mm. um, or as many times as you want but not having a specific yeah. number in mind yeah but nobody should be being so told like for example read uh, Surah Al-Waqi'ah 43 times or read mm. Surah Yasin 57 times or say Ya uh, Qawiyu Ya Azim, like 212 times in the morning and 213 mm. times in the evening, all yeah. kinds of strange numbers. Yeah. You have to say to them, somebody gives you a number, you have yeah. to say to them, Do you have a proof for this number? Yeah. If you don't, mm. then I, I can't make mm. something specific yeah. in the Sharia that, that yeah. wasn't made specific. Yeah. So, Shaykh, one thing we mentioned with, with the Rukia that we're not promising like quick results, you know, but we're promising like pure results like you said there yeah you know so a lot of people kind of looking for quick fixes they think you know oh put this amulet or do this you know the without it's, it's i would say a bit of laziness you definitely know. Yeah. i think the thing is the first thing people need to understand is there's no quicker fix than turning to allah mm. but how quick that will be that's in the hands of allah which are like mm. there's no quicker fix than turning to allah mm. if you turn to the shaitan you're not going to get it fixed any quicker yeah. in fact what you might get is a fake quick fix where you yeah. think it's fixed but actually it gets worse after a while yeah. but the quickest fix you're ever going to get is turning to Allah mm. a lot of people want the, the cure without the effort mm. you see a lot of people like that so what they'll say to you is they'll say to you that look uh, you know uh, if I put the ta'weed I don't have to read anything I don't have to do anything mm. I just put ta'weed on my neck and I, that's it it actually doesn't work I mean mm. if it works it, it actually causes more problems than mm. it, it solves mm. And it's absolutely forbidden and it might even take a person outside of Islam depending on what's in there, what they believe about yeah. it and so on. It's, that's not a quick fix. That's actually, mm. you know, a person may end up even going to Jahannam seeking a quick fix. Yeah. But that's not, that actually doesn't bring yeah. you a quick fix. What, yeah. There's no fix that is quicker than turning to Allah mm. Mm. And, that, and knowing that that will take whatever time that Allah decreed mm. it to take. Why does it take a long time? This is a question a lot of people ask and I try my best to answer. People say, well, why? If Allah says, kun fayakun, why should it take a long time? Mm -hmm. And that's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a wisdom in everything that He does. Mm -hmm. And from the wisdom of Allah Azza wa Jal in what He does is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees certain things to take mm -hmm. time in order for your reward to increase, mm -hmm. in order for your sins to be forgiven, in order for the cure to come at the best time for you in order for you to make even more dua and get more good mm. deeds. There mm. are many reasans why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm. decrees things to happen at certain times. Mm. At the end of the day, it's exactly like dua. You raise mm. your hands, you say, Oh Allah, enrich me. Isn't mm. Allah capable of sending down mm. gold and silver to rain mm. down from the sky? Of course. Yeah. But that's not the sunnah of Allah, right? Mm. That's not how yeah. Allah 
yeah. does things generally speaking with most of Bani Adam. Rather, mm. what happens is that Allah mm. subhanahu wa ta'ala will open an opportunity here mm. and you'll take some steps and you'll try and mm. you'll make an effort and then finally mm. that result. How did it happen to the Prophet? Subhanallah, yeah. Pro they, the seerah. Yeah, this is the thing. Like, you, you know, you, Allah knows what's best for you as well. You know, I Definitely. remember when you know I, I had somebody who was had an issue with this, and it brought them back to the Quran. They realized they was neglecting the Quran, and the whole family was neglecting the Quran. And Subhanallah, it it, it actually brought them back to the Quran. It was actually a good yeah. thing for them. You know, to say that a trial, you know, we know that these trials they have wisdoms, wisdom you know? and good. And mm. look, and I often give people example. I say, just look at the seerah mm. of the Prophet Just mm. look at just look at the seerah. Yeah. When the Prophet is the purest, has the purest heart, mm. the most obedience, the you know the furthest away from anything that mm. is that is wrong or haram, and yet how long did he take to get victory over his enemies? Mm. His victory didn't come uh, come in one day. Yet his du'a was answered. Mm. Mm -hmm. Allah give me victory one one moment. Kun fayakun. Yet it took him a period of twenty three years to gain victory over his Subhan enemies Allah. before Allah Subhanahu wa Taala opened up Mecca for him. Mm and Al-Fatih, the conquest of yeah. Mecca, that's because that in itself had so much good mm. for him and for us. Subhanallah. And Subhanallah. and that's why sometimes yeah. people need to understand that it's not about getting something today or tomorrow. Mm. Allah can give it to you today or tomorrow. Yeah. It's about you taking the means, make the causes, yeah. taking the steps, making dua, mm. and whenever it's good for you, and be willing to be patient. Mm. Mm. It's not that I'm saying Allah's not going to answer me. Mm. When I make dua, like the Prophet ﷺ, he said, make dua wa antum bil ijabah. When you are certain Allah's going to answer mm. you. Every time I make dua and say, Allah give us shifa, I mm. believe that dua is going to be answered. SubhanAllah. But I'm willing mm. to have sabr. Mm. I'm ready to have sabr mm. if Allah has decreed that mm. it doesn't get answered immediately because of a wisdom that's with him, I'm willing to have sabr. Mm. Even though I, I, when I make that dua, I make it with certainty that it will be answered. Yeah. I don't ever make yeah. it like, well, Allah, if you want to cure me, cure me. And if you don't want to cure me, mm. don't cure me. Like the people when they say, yeah. inshallah, like, well, Allah, yeah, yeah, inshallah, yeah. if you in shit to, you know, know, if you wish, not, cure me. It's not real, you, inshallah. It's it's <laughs> not, like, weird, at yeah. the end of the day, yeah. it's the word inshallah mm. when you make dua, that's what mm. it means. It means if you want to cure me and if you don't want, don't cure yeah. me. That's why we've been prohibited mm. from saying inshallah when we make dua. Mm -hmm. Instead, you say ameen or yeah. accept yeah. it from me. And you can't force Allah to do something. You can only yeah. ask Him. Yeah. But when you ask Him, you ask Him with mm. determination mm. and certainty and conviction. Yeah. Just finally, um, you know, for maybe some of the non-Muslims are actually tuning in because I'm probably going to give it a bit of a clickbait title. <laughs> 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 so, so for the for the non-Muslims who are uh, tuning in, of course, I mean, the first advice would be to become Muslim. But if people are are actually suffering from these things what advice or what 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 comment would you have for them so i i actually wrote an article on my website with regard to how non-muslims can 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 get treatment um i i think i would absolutely advise them to to really genuinely consider islam and islamic treatment as a as a real option for them um and and to be honest i think that's all i can advise them on because it's not for me to advise them about which doctor to go to or which yeah. medication to take. Mm. But it's to say that at the end of the day, mm. this affliction you have is coming from something which is unknown to you and unseen to you. Yeah. And therefore you have to go back to the one who knows it and the one who sees it. Mm. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are many ways that they can get treatment. Um, for example, th uh, they could uh, get a Muslim to recite Qur'an for them and that mm. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu sahabi he recited Qur'an for a non-Muslim mm. and there are other companions who did the same as well mm. uh, so it's perfectly permissible mm. uh, they could get for example some of the water that's been recited over or the oil that's been recited over and and likewise you know just uh, the the, uh, the in the article I mentioned a number of, of sort of options for them but ultimately all of those options are always going to be secondary to actually accepting Islam mm. and really being able yeah. to you know truly worship Allah and mm. truly repent and truly then engage with the treatment properly yeah. but yes it is possible to try yeah. to help someone and yeah. ultimately if I see someone sincere they come to me as an mm. Muslim and say they're sincere they say look I would really genuinely like you know to explore yeah. the Islamic treatment I'll be more than happy to do mm. my best to give them mm. what I could give them yeah. with what I have yeah. 
Um, of if, course, have the full effect. Really, you need that absolutely. In mind and, the, you know, and, and then a person on top of that, a person might say, "Well, okay, what about if I can't reach any Muslim at all?" Mm. Let me say, at the very least, perhaps you could listen to some of the Quran. Mm. You know, listen and maybe yeah. read some, read the translation, and appreciate what's being said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, maybe we could post mm. a link of of some rukia yeah. audio. It's yeah. not really treatment as such, yeah. but you know, at the end of the it's day, a start, yeah. it's a start for somebody, yeah. isn't it? Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. You know, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's like you say, it's, it's a big topic, and it's a big topic. Uh, it's, I, I wanted to, you know, speak about this because, you know, I think I think there's a massive kind of door for dawah in in rukia. Um, there because, is because so many people, usually people, when they're going through through these big spiritual tests, even non-Muslims. I mean, I know so many people came to Islam through, you know, these type of things, Definitely. and and uh, you know, we encourage people to. Definitely, you know. and that's that's really why mm. I got involved in it to begin with. And a lot of people, yeah. sometimes people criticize and say, well, mm. you know, should you really be using up your time with this? Shouldn't mm. you be busy with something more important? Mm. We say that, you know, this is such a big opportunity mm. to call people to the worship of Allah alone, mm. to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, whether mm. they are Muslims who've gone astray from that, whether mm. they're not Muslim and they're going to come to that. It's such a big opportunity. Mm. One thing I would definitely recommend is if we could post a link to a, a video on how to go about Rukia, how to start yeah. Rukia, because we didn't really go into too much detail on the actual yeah. process. We'll I'll put that um, in the description. We have like the we? simple self Rukia video, which yeah, is just a, on your, uh, just a really yeah. basic, like sort yeah. of how to get started, just yeah. for people who are interested yeah. in that. I mean, you, you have more topic. extensive uh, courses as well, but again, it, it's a lot of yeah. information. For I taking. personally like the, yeah. the, the simple one that's yeah. a couple of hours long and just yeah. get started, because yeah. ultimately yeah. this is a... a and again, like, it kind of is, it becomes borderline entertaining. Not entertaining, yeah. but it's interesting, right? So you, you, yeah, but, you, but you you want you want to get straight to the. It's definitely you know, the, true. The detail. It's about it's one of those things about which you could say Bahrun la sahila. Mm -hmm. It's a sea that doesn't have a shore. You know, like it's a. <laughs> yeah. it, it, you could just go forever learning yeah. about this. Yeah. So it, it's important for people, particularly mm -hmm. people who are afflicted or have a family member mm -hmm. who's afflicted, to get the information they yeah. need to start yeah. right now Learn the basics, today. Yeah. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Well, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much for joining Barakallah us. Barakallah, uh, it's been an absolute just, pleasure. For anyone out there, just please, you know, if you are suffering with these things, just don't lose hope, you know, subhanAllah. You know, we've learned so much in this podcast. Just go away and study, learn what you need to know, and, and inshallah, may, step by step. You know, Allah will cure you. Ameen. Ameen. <laughs> Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Well, yeah, Ahbabta walakin Allah yahdi man yasha.